Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism Global Journalism Seminar Series. We are inching our way out of lockdown with kind of tentative sandwiches in the sunshine and tentative conversations with people we haven't seen in real life for a very long time. I wanted to start this seminar series with our journalist fellows who have been with us um, most of them have been with us since January, that one, one has been since, here since October. They, we have carried on the fellowship here despite lockdown, speaking about the future of journalism and the challenges facing the news industry, because it feels that it's vital to have these conversations now more than ever. Today, I'm handing the floor over to our journalist fellows to give you a sense of where journalism is, where it's going and where it could be um, around the world. Over to you guys. Hi, my name is Peter Erte. I'm senior editor and director at 444.hu in Hungary. I arrived in Oxford on the day the lockdown started in January. I think there are very few places in the world where you can be mostly stuck in your room and still have your horizons radically broadened. From a WhatsApp radio channel in Zambia to a profitable current affairs weekly aimed at 12 year olds in Finland or a lock screen news outlet working with phone manufacturers in Indonesia we heard about so many amazing initiatives in the Hillary term. Back in Hungary, probably the most challenging media environment in the European Union, we run an independent website delivering news analysis and investigations to millions of people. I came to Oxford to research an issue that is, I think, pivotal to our survival. How to get our readers pay for our work while still making sure that our public service journalism reaches the widest possible audience. In a low choice and frankly, at times repressive environment, we must get our wealthy readers to subsidize access for those who cannot afford it. Most of the research around media business focuses on North America and Western Europe and how certain funding models may impact the state of democracy. I'm looking at the same dilemma, but from an opposite perspective. How does the, ch how does the state of democracy challenging political environments influence the business models of media outlets? My interest is not exactly academic. Our political realities in Hungary shape many of our business decisions. And I'm trying to map out how much of this dynamic exists in other countries and see what kind of solutions others came up with. How do you make an audience revenue program work under a liberal rule? I'm speaking to outlets in Central and Eastern Europe, Central and South America, Africa, and Asia. And despite being worlds away, I do find very similar challenges and exciting solutions. While we often look at giants like the New York Times or the Guardian for inspiration, I keep finding innovation in places where coming up with smart and efficient solutions is not a choice, but an absolute necessity. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Chitra, and I'm a financial journalist from India. Over the past 15 years, I've worked for the Times of India, Reuters, and other media houses. Uh, for the first decade of my career, I was free to report truthfully and sometimes critically about the failures of the establishment. Uh, under Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, a renowned economist, we had this freedom. Uh, but since 2014, under current Prime Minister Narendra Modi, I've seen a marked shift in Indian reporting. Uh, as a financial journalist, I did not always get the freedom to criticize decisions like a new tax regime and demonetization, which brought great hardship to millions. Uh, there's also corruption and chronic capitalism that has gone underreported, and so has the problem of public sector banks, bad loans at public sector banks. Uh, but it's far worse than an economic crisis. Uh, there's religious intolerance and hate mongering, which is on the rise, and uh, the impact on journalists covering these issues. So as high as 154 journalists have been arrested, detained, or interrogated in the last decade, 40% of these cases were reported in 2020 alone. We are now the country with the most internet shutdowns. We saw at least 64 shutdowns in 2020, uh, and the unrest is palpable. We have seen the Delhi riots last year and the farmers protest this year. And reporting on these issues brings with it dire consequences. Um, take the example of Siddiqui Kapan. Uh, he was arrested by the Uttar Pradesh police on October 5 for uh, conspiring against the state government. And his crime was that he went to interview the family of a Dalit girl who had been raped. And last month, there were three more journalists who were arrested for reporting on something as seemingly innocent as children shivering in the cold during a government function. 
And uh, let's also not forget those who pay the ultimate price like senior journalist Gauri Lankesh, uh, who was shot dead in 2017. Gaudi was my friend. She came from my city, Bangalore, and it came as a huge shock to me and my fellow journalists in India. And that's where the fellowship helped. <laughs> what I learned in the Hillary term is that journalists are part of a global community and we are not alone in India. Uh, listening to Zimbabwean journalist Hopeful Chinua speak to us soon after his arrest and detention, or to my Pakistani colleague Ramisha Ali about journalists facing arrest and detention in Pakistan, these and many more stories have made me realize we aren't alone in this and we should continue our mission to bring people the best possible information. It's made me realize that there are journalists worldwide taking on corruption, excesses and powerful people from governments to mafias. Uh, we are together facing job losses, arrests, detention and sometimes death. And it has been powerful and empowering to realize I'm part of something bigger than my state or my country's problems that there are others reporting, reporting fairly, accurately, and to the best of their abilities in the face of danger. Hi, um, I'm Ipshita. I work for Scroll, which is a digital daily in India. I'm mostly based in Delhi. As a reporter and editor, I, I'd always focused on the editorial side of things. I, didn't pay much attention to the business of news, the levers that control it, how it is spread, how it is read, who reads it, and how fact-checked independent journalism may be sustained. That is something we talked about a lot this term. Quite frankly, I thought it had little to do with my interests at first, but now I find it has deepened my understanding of journalism and of what we are fighting to protect especially because in India, as Rachel explained, the space for a free press is shrinking every day. My research is on, is on the clampdown on the local press in Kashmir, a region that has seen an armed movement for self-determination. For decades, the central government has used repressive measures to stamp out dissent here. These measures intensified after August 2019, when sweeping legislative changes stripped Kashmir of autonomy, even within the ambit of the Indian constitution. Amid mass arrests and a communications blackout, the local press was decimated. Papers could not go to print. Journalists could not go out to report. Those who did faced harassment, arrest, and violence. Government ads, the mainstay of the local press, were withdrawn until papers towed the establishment line. Many of us in the Indian mainland thought these aggressions were restricted to Kashmir. In the national imaginary, it has always been the zone of exception. But many of the freedoms we thought we could take for granted are vanishing. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. Stories we would have published without a thought a few years ago now have to be weighed carefully. Does the public interest in putting this piece out match the risks involved? At the same time, funds are shrinking because government regulations have raised barriers and because private advertisers and sponsors shrink away in this atmosphere of fear. Meanwhile, news is at the mercy of the mysterious algorithms of social media. In India, social media companies have been accused of colluding with those in power to, su to suppress some kinds of information and accounts and to privilege others. We spent much of Hillary term trying to reckon with these silent forces. Who should regulate hate speech and misinformation online? Should social media organizations pay for news content? How can we persuade readers to pay for independent journalism? We heard from executives at Facebook and Google. We heard from New Zealand's largest newspaper group, which decided to boycott Facebook and thrived. We read about exiled Burundian journalists who used WhatsApp to reach audiences after their radio stations were shut down back home. There are many questions and often the answers are elusive, but it felt if nothing else, a little less lonely. Um, hi, I'm Dermed from Kyrgyzstan, um, picking up on where Ipshida finished. Um, last term, we talked a lot about the overarching issue of the global tech companies and their impact on journalism, politics, and social fabrics around the world. 
a lot of those discussions were driven by certain events in American politics, which led Western governments to pressure platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Google, and YouTube to take measures against misinformation, hate speech, and extremism. After the 2016 presidential elections, tech companies were accused of eroding the American democracy after a Russian influence campaign targeted American voters with ads and fake accounts. Years later, the end of Donald Trump's presidency was marked by the storming of the US Capitol on January 6. A proliferation of conspiracy theories, false claims by politicians and right-wing rhetoric online led to the violent unrest. Elsewhere, the real world harm of online misinformation had long been known. Rumors spread on Facebook and WhatsApp incited violence and murders in India and Myanmar Troll armies targeted journalists in Azerbaijan and the Philippines. A viral fake messaging campaign on WhatsApp helped Jair Bolsonaro win Brazilian presidency. And Ukraine, where I worked for over four years before coming to Oxford, has been fighting Russian state propaganda on a parallel track with the real war in the Donbass. Yet, calls for actions from citizens in those countries went unnoticed as if the skewed elections and mob violence were results of our dysfunctional states or polarized societies only, and not tech companies' oversight. As British journalist Helen Lewis wrote for The Atlantic, so many major, major tech companies are based in Silicon Valley that the rules for the entire world are set there and by politicians in Washington. But it's not all gloomy. While the rules uh, of the global web are set by a small group of tech executives in Silicon Valley, activists and journalists around the world take a stand against online misinformation, especially in the time of the pandemic. And this fellowship, fellowship gave us an opportunity to learn from them. Um, I personally found interesting how two media outlets in Spain fight COVID hoaxes with data visualization and crowdsourcing by using the same engaging tactics as the bad guys. All of this resonates with my project for this fellowship on how journalists use the Telegram messaging app, especially to deal with misinformation and political manipulation. Telegram is a lesser known platform in the West and it has become one of the digital refuges for deplatformed fringe groups. What can journalists do to use this platform to our advantage? And what kinds of information sharing behavior should we be keeping an eye out for? Misinformation is a truly global issue that spreads across languages and states pushed by algorithms, bots and bad actors. And it will take the concerted effort of governments, citizens, journalists, and of course, tech companies to fight it. Hello, my name is Malva from Nicaragua. I work as a digital content editor for an online platform called Managua Furiosa, where we talk about sexual and reproductive rights, gender equality and human rights. I'm working at the moment in this fellowship on a guidebook for journalists in Nicaragua that will explain how to cover emergencies. What I found is a treasure trove of digital tools that will help us do this, whether gathering information in the chaotic aftermath of an emergency or reporting a site safely during natural disasters, civil unrest or tech blackouts. Technology may pose challenges, but it also changes the way we do and present our journalism. Um, consider the news gathering and disseminating work happening at TikTok, which is something that we have explored in Managua Furiosa as well, because not only give us more exposure, but also give us an opportunity to talk about these issues in a more creative way to engage with our audience. Um, another example is what my fellow Christine's work uh, uh, that she's doing at Glance in Indonesia, where they're delivering news on the lock screen of your phone. And the many online tools like this on the screen that help journalists to locate, verify, and report accurate information, which is going to be very helpful for the manual handbook that I'm creating. And finally, consider this example from El País and their infographics team. 
They use moving visual diagrams to tell a story about the virus in a way that could be easily understood by many. We often talk about the challenges of the changing world to journalism, and it's been very encouraging to see how some of these changes are helping us to do a better job. Hi, um, my name is Christine from Indonesia, where I work as managing editor for news at lock screen content platform Glance. Like Malva, I'm also interested in the interplay between news consumption and technology. My research will investigate the importance of lock screen on mobile phone as a medium for news distribution. Albeit the lockdown Hillary term was an intense one. There are a lot of seminars in discussion about the complicated relation between platforms and publishers, balance and neutrality, diversity in the newsroom, and the challenges faced by media industry in many countries. But what surprised me the most is what the studies say about the connection between news diet, echo chamber, filter bubbles, and polarization. Research from 2019 concludes that the concern over the so-called media echo chamber are overstated. Although people like to read news that reflect their political view, most of them actually don't really avoid the news with opposing view. The study also mentioned that most news diets are more diverse and centrist. Another interesting study in the US in 2013 investigated the relation between the effect of partisan media and the growing political polarization in the society. It turns out the study didn't find any strong causal evidence that partisan media in the US was making ordinary citizen more polarized. And on, on filter bubble, research focusing on news personalization in 2016 hasn't found any significant empirical evidence as well that support this concern. This doesn't mean that the conversation about this is not important, but many believe that news personalization is still in the early stage. And the evidence show that our fear is exaggerated. Of course, this study I mentioned from, come from the West and mostly US centric. I believe we need more research like this, especially in the global South, where this kind of study are often lacking. However, these findings challenge my own assumption on the role of journalism in the society. Personally, I thought that media echo chamber and filter bubble are some of the pressing issue faced by the newsroom nowadays. But if these assumptions are overstated, what does it mean for the newsrooms and their strategies? There are so many follow-up questions, and I hope the discussion continues not only here, but also in our respective newsroom. Hi, I'm Mark Olo from Nairobi, Kenya. And I'm the production editor at the Standard Media in this fellowship, I'm doing a project on how the Kenyan media is seeking to address issues and concerns around quality and trust. But my major take home last semester was the existent value of diversity in the newsroom, especially thinking of my country where ethnic divisions are an issue and pockets of the society feel left out in key spheres. At the same time, the trust in the media is shrinking. Every election year, polarization peaks and divisions emerge, even within the media itself. From seminars we, we've, we had here on race and diversity, my lesson number one is that lack of diversity simply leads to no diverse content, no diverse voices, no diverse thoughts, and a no diverse audience. My lesson too on this subject is that diversity can lead to collective objectivity in a newsroom. And has been widely witnessed, lack of diversity only breeds discontent among the audience, 
who would just walk away or simply switch off. And from my newspaper background, I'm interested in how the legacy media can win back and retain diverse audiences. And I believe that women, the younger generations, minority groups, and other marginalized people deserve greater inclusion. There can never be a better time for newsrooms to embrace diversity. So hi, my name is Jenny and uh, I work as a producer in the Helsingin Sanomat newspaper in Finland. So when we talk about diversity, the thing that comes to mind first is often gender balance, depending on where you live. The most important takeaway for me from this term was that diversity is a complex issue and uh, journalism has to look at it from multiple different angles and not only gender. We have to have a deep conversation about what kind of a reality we are pushing and whose reality it is. For instance, we are often oblivious to the fact that we largely tell stories by middle class people to other middle class people. Finland is a socially homogenous country and a great place to be a journalist in. There is stability and safety, which also means we have a free press, but this also has its own caveats. I mean, if people in your social bubble live quite comfortably, you easily start to think that the people outside your bubble do too. But sadly, this is not the case. I'm specialized in health content, and one of the areas where lack of diversity is obvious is mental health reporting. The COVID pandemic has really highlighted this problem as we are now also facing a global mental health crisis. There is more domestic abuse, uh, there's more depression, more school dropouts than in a very long time, and we are yet to face the consequences. So recently journalism has been on a spree of breaking mental health taboos, and we have done a lot of good in this field already. But at the same time, we have to keep asking ourselves whose taboos we are breaking and are we doing enough? I want to highlight a case that happened at the end of last year when a hacker leaked the contact information and psychotherapy records of tens of thousands of Finnish people and threatened to make them public unless the victims pay him. The Finnish media responded with attempts to disarm the hacker, declaring how, quote, you should not feel ashamed if you go to therapy. They all meant well, but again, they saw mental health issues from a very middle class perspective. There are still many deep health taboos that we rarely or never get to read about. Someone who is, for instance, treated for schizophrenia or has borderline personality disorder with violent behavior, they cannot choose to expose their stories because it could destroy their livelihoods and even lives. Journalism still has this stereotypical arc for mental health stories. There's often someone working a comfortable job who gets burnout, recovers, and then simply goes on with their life. We like to paint recovery as an individual success story, but we rarely address the structural factors that also go behind mental health issues. We absolutely love stories about empowerment and therapy, even though the people who need therapy the most often cannot even access it. We sometimes overuse the battle metaphor but we fail to understand that many people cannot even afford to battle. This is in no way meant to belittle anyone's personal recovery journey. It is just that these stories are not very diverse in nature. The truth is mental health often isn't cathartic. So we need more stories about people who relapse and wait for years to get treatment or get sent from clinic to clinic, and maybe they never get better. Because one of the purposes of journalism is to make the people who disappear between the lines visible again. I know that these stories are not easy to tell or sell, but they are crucial in order to understand society and the human psyche. And finally, they also highlight another important lesson that I was reminded of during the Hillary term, which is that tackling diversity issues doesn't always feel comfortable because it has to happen outside of your own personal comfort zone. Hi, uh, my name is Thor and I'm from Norway. I work as a news editor in a local newspaper in Finnmark. It's in the 
far north of Norway. Uh, my mother is from the Sami indigenous people. That's why I am looking into the way indigenous people are covered in Norwegian media. I have worked as a journalist and editor in the small community I live in for over 25 years. So it's great to break away from the daily routine and think about my industry. My home country is often seen as the model for democracy, social welfare, and gender equality. However, ethnic minorities are still underrepresented in Norwegian media and politics, and that is affecting their media coverage. There's also a lot of racism in Norway. I was moved by Shasia Marjit's talk to us. He, she is a Norwegian journalist in Norway, and she's working in most prominent newspaper, VG. Shasia is of Pakistani origin, and she shared her experience of facing threats and hatred, not only as a woman, but as a Muslim person of immigrant background. Being a half Sami myself, I could relate to her sentiment about the ignorance of ethnic minorities in our country. February 6th is Sami National Day. On this slide, I show you the top article that day for Norway's largest online newspaper, VG. The title reads, Oh yes, you're wearing such clown clothes. This is the Sami folk costume called kufta in Norwegian, which is described so disrespectfully. In the article, VG has talked to four young Sami about what it's like to be Sami in 2021. All four of them, like me, are proud of our culture, but it can also be uncomfortable to show it off. When 20-year-old Emilia Madeleine Beatty Jensen moved to start high school, she experienced for the first time being part of a minority as a Sami. In the town of Kirkenes in Norway, she also had her first experiences with ugly comments. The first time I wear kofta at school, someone said to me, oh yes, you have put on such clown clothes. I did not know how to deal with it because I had never experienced it before, she tells the newspaper. And making hateful remarks against the Sami has been up in the Norwegian court. A man in his 50s was sentenced to 18 days probation and a fine of 15,000 Norwegian crowns. It's like uh, 1,300 pounds. The 50-year-old has been found guilty of making several hateful remarks against the Sami on Facebook. He also referred to Kufta as a ridiculous clown costume. Another Sami youth, 18-year-old Bide Helen Eira, tells VG that she may find it uncomfortable to wear a Kufta among other people. I'm always waiting to get an ugly comment. It is regrettable that people still in 2021 have to experience that. It should not be acceptable, she told the newspaper. Even in countries that seem to be doing well, like Norway, we have work to do, make sure we are more inclusive and welcoming of differences. Hi, my name is Adele. I'm an environmental journalist from Brazil, and I work as an editor for a public TV station in Sao Paulo called TV Cultura, and also as a reporter for National Geographic Brazil. My research here in Oxford is on how to tell stories about the environment to reach a bigger audience. As we know, the environment and climate issues are deeply related to politics and economy, and journalists covering them face all kinds, all kinds of threats and harassments. In Brazil, it is no different. 
According to the Reporters Without Borders, there were almost 600 attacks against the country's media in 2020. President Bolsonaro's regime brought an even more difficult environment for journalists as he is constantly attempting to discredit media professionals and promoting disinformation and negating of science, especially on the pandemic, which leads to extreme polarization. At the same time, recently, the UN has addressed climate disruption, pollution, and biodiversity loss as the main crisis faced by humans nowadays and which can threaten our own species which makes it even more important to reach as many people with environmental stories. In 2019 and 2020, levels of deforestation in Brazil increased and lots of, of environmental policies were dismantled, making it easier to illegal miners, land grabbers, and non-sustainable farmers, and putting ecosystems, indigenous and traditional peoples in danger. In the face of the scary and worrying scenario that, that I'm telling you, environment journalists are facing, are, are sorry, are struggling to do their work to provide checked and high quality information to audience. Having all that in mind, one of the best things that I've learned at Reuters was the importance of having a network of support and exchanging experience with other journalists from different countries as powerful tools to fight against attacks and promote a more safe working environment. Talking to other journalists about what's happening in your country or with you specifically and listening to them can make it easier to find a solution or to know the best way to act in awkward situations. Working together is also important to rebuild trust and to improve journalism practice. For instance, I was inspired to learn about an initiative by Kenyan journalists to improve accuracy in the media and win back the public trust. In addition, as we face a deep race and gender inequality in newsrooms all over my country, I have learned in the last term at Reuters that the best way to guarantee that stories of underrepresented groups are told is to use our space in journalism to speak up for these groups and work to implement real diversity in newsrooms. If we do not have diversity in newsrooms, we will only be telling stories from privileged people to privileged people and may never reach equality for all minority groups. Hi. I'm a Brazilian journalist and one of the directors of the Brazilian Association of Investigative Journalism. One of my goals in Abraji and also my research subject in this fellowship is to spread the word of Freedom of Information Act among journalists, also known as FOIA or FOI. For those who don't know it, the different versions of this law allow any citizens to request information from governments around the world. Today, more than 130 countries have some kind of FOIA or FOI. But journalists are struggling to make it work in practice. In Brazil, although our FOIA is almost 10 years old, only half of the journalists have used it at least once, according to a national survey we have made this far. It is still a challenge to make these laws work in practice, but I realized during the discussions we've had during this fellowship and the articles that I've been reading that some barriers and challenges to access public data and information are similar in our countries. I'd like to share some quick ideas that I learned and could be pursued to improve FOIA response and investigative journalism using data and documents. One, you need to be persistent. It's very common that officers will deny your request even if you have the right to access information. Sometimes they don't know where to find records or maybe your request was not detailed enough. In Brazil, two out of three appeals are successful. Two, think with a document mindset. When you read the news, a politician speech, or any interviews with public officers, is it possible to check what they are saying in documents or go deeper in the subject? If the authority says the government's monitoring the results of a public policy, how exactly it's being measured? Can you get the data? Three, think in patterns and try to find them in public documents. Two years ago, for example, I had to report on a shelter for vulnerable children in Sao Paulo in Brazil that was accused of negligence, allowing cases of torture and rape. 
after a FOIA request, we found that this was not an isolated case. It was becoming common and that some of the organizations that run these places were still getting public contracts in the city. Four, make requests every day if you can. We journalists work for public interest. This is our main goal. Our questions publish transparency forward in our countries and can help improve accountability. Five, share your request with your team in the newsroom. Sometimes the data is not useful for you, but can be really important in another story or just to give ideas to other journalists. And six, and the last one, if your request is denied, it can be a story too. Sometimes a negative response may lead to something more important than the response itself. Why is the government denying such basic information about, about a public contract, for example? Publish it. Pressure leads to more transparency. Ayla, you're muted. We can't hear you. Sorry for that. Hi, again, hi, I'm Ayla, uh, an Arab journalist who joined a Reuters Pillar Shop three months ago. <clears throat> Actually, what I have learned during my studies with the Reuters Institute for Journalism and what I have trained and uh, practiced is how to accept different opinions. I admit that many like that skill or virtue in our Arab countries, once we uh, adopt an idea, we find it difficult to really consider the different points of view, even we listen to them. Maybe it doesn't go far beyond the limits of the years. But during uh, the Hillary term, we have analyzed and critiqued various topics and ideas and discussed them among fellows who, who come from different nationalities, culture and experiences, but with a common ground of affection, tolerance and empathy. Accepting understanding different opinions become easier, which positively uh, broadened our um, horizon and made our view of things deeper and more comprehensive. Um, at the end of the day, every human being um, has only one pair of eyes from which we can see one or two angles at maximum. But when we share this vision with others, we, we can see the details from multiple angles. And sharing experience and opinions um, reminds me of a wise thing by one of the great Egyptian intellectuals who said, um, I like box not be because I'm in ascetic in life, but rather I love box because one life is not enough for me. And it's exactly what happens when we share and exchange our experience or um, perceptions uh, multiply. Um, as a journalist, I have always been patient about human stories and because of my travels to many countries, I have listened to many different uh, ones. Most recently, I have heard uh, the stories of journalists in exile, stories that haven't yet been told. And these exiled journalists were the ones who gave voice to the news of the day. What, when, um, but uh, what happens when you are the news? We also need to be reported on, for each of us has a hidden story. These are stories of resistance, um, hair to break, a bitterness in the throat and the hair. It, it, it may or not always be possible to tell full stories. We may to conceal chapters for several reasons, but there are many journalists in exile who carry these personal stories like, like a heavy stone with them. Um, it's why uh, my work here will focus on speaking to journalists in exile and uh, those who seek to help them. And during her return, we have heard from many Arab and foreign journalists who were able to 
emerges strong from wars and, or persecution, um, such as Wad al Khatib and Shazia uh, um, Majid, uh, Wad al Khatib from Syria, or Shazia um, Majid from Pakistan. And, and we learn it how they reached a safe haven at last. And we are, um, were able to rebuild themselves and success. Uh, despite and many difficulties they faced um, along the journey. I think we need to hear the, um, those people's voices. Thank you. Hi. My name is Ramesh Ali. I'm a multimedia journalist from Pakistan. My time in Oxford was focused on hearing about lessons learned by digital born news organizations in the global south. Their examples and experiences will be essential for building stronger digital journalists in Pakistan, a country which is gradually understanding and adopting the role of technology and digital tools in journalism. I am 27 and right now standing at a crucial point in my journalism career, where my choices will determine my growth. I am now back in Pakistan after completing the fellowship, and I know I owe it to this fellowship for broadening my horizon, for helping me understand journalism in its truest essence. Journalism, much like this fellowship, is what you make of it. Just as we fellows, attend the same sessions and seminars and take vastly different lessons away, so too can journalists attend the same press conferences, protests or tragedies and can come away with vastly different understanding. What you get out of this trade depends on how you engage with people. To extend the metaphor, the most valuable lessons learned during the fellowship were from the fellows themselves, especially when you meet and get to know each other understand their culture, share food, travel, and even go for groceries together. Leaning into learning about each other enriches the end result, both story and the fellowship. And you can determine that outcome. Over to you, Mira. Thank you very much, all of you, for your presentation. The Journalist Fellowship Programme is about conversations, about debate and about learning. What's really clear from this fellowship is that the global perspectives on journalism are absolutely vital and there needs to be more research, more conversation, more input from the journalists on the front line the world over because sometimes you end up with a situation where, the, where kind of the US and the Europe drives the conversation and drives the debate and drives the kind of way issues are perceived and then it has an impact on people around the world and they don't they don't get to say how this is impacting them and the fellowship absolutely touches on this. You can put all your cameras on I'll go to some of the questions we've got from um, from people there. Um, one question for Rachel and for Upsita about press freedom and certainly the attacks on journalists in India. Um, there have been about eight journalists murdered in India in the last year. Who is usually behind these killings? How do these kind of killings come about? Ipsita, do you want to maybe take this one? Hi, uh, thanks for the question. I, um, I'm afraid I can't, it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, trace the source of violence to any one actor. Uh, I'm afraid I'll have to read a little more closely about the, the eight specific cases over the last year. But, um, you know, over the last two or three years, there is, uh, you know, Rachel mentioned Gauri Lankesh, whose killing was blamed on kind of um, Hindu right-wing fundamentalist groups. Um, I knew an editor in Kashmir who was uh, shot dead in 2018, um, and he, his killing was blamed on, uh, you know, sort of militant groups, uh, even though kind of that case is, uh, you know, there's, sort of, there's a, there's, various theories about that, but Kashmir is a separate context altogether because it's seen years of conflict. Uh, then there was, you know, a journalist killed a few years ago in the northeastern uh, state of Tripura, where he'd gone to report. Uh, it's, a, it's a tribal state and uh, he was killed by an irate um, local mob. Uh, so it's hard to pin it down to anyone. I think it's a good question because I think it's there's 
who issues, which is who's directly responsible for the killing, who pulls the trigger or who, who gathers the mob. But then there's also a sense of who creates the environment where it's where journalists are so so unsafe, who creates an, an, an environment where it's acceptable to attack journalists, um, where it's acceptable to kill with impunity. And this is kind of a wider question for all of society. I think that's worth looking at carefully. So thank you, Yipsita. Um, question for Louis, look on freedom of information, because this is something again, this last year we've seen in several countries that freedom of information requests have been put on hold or delayed um, with governments and officials using the pandemic as an excuse. And it's really affected the amount of information journalists can access in, in their work, especially when there's so other, there's a few other sources and face-to-face -face reporting, for example, is much harder to do. The question is how did Brazil's FOIA come to exist 10 years ago? What were the drivers behind it? Who was campaigning for it? And have the request become harder to achieve under Bolsonaro? So uh, the Brazilian FOI is, uh, is something that the society won after a lot of struggling in the Congress. It was approved by some initiatives of the society. So Abraji, the Brazilian Association of Investigative Journalism was one of, the, of these bodies uh, fighting for the approval of this law. And I think we, we, today we have a good law because of the way it was built. So in the federal government, which has more than 1 million requests so far, uh, we have a structure where uh, you can make it for appeals. So if you don't agree with the response, you can appeal to a body of technicians. So even if the politician in power is that doesn't agree to release some data, it's possible that you can request and then appeal. So if you don't agree, you can appeal a lot of times. Of course, the, 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 this body is also uh, 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 related to the president. So the president is the one who nominates the person there, but it's harder It makes, let's say, uh, it's the, the cost is elevated if the person tries to hide information. So uh, we are seeing some problems with Bolsonaro related to some kinds of data. For example, uh, the, the expenditures that he has in his travels, uh, it's hard to get this kind of information. They, they are putting more, more sealed in a lot, a lot of documents. They say they are sensitive documents. But at the same time, I, I would say that it's very hard to remove the law because the law is very strong and a lot of people are using it. So if you start to deny documents all the time, people, people will press the government. It, it's impossible, I would say, to, to deny all the information now because the law is strong in Brazil. Thanks very much, Luis. And kind of final question, which is really for all of you, which is, are, are you working on any single or more issues in collaboration with each other in this fellowship? I think I can, I can answer this for you, but I'd be interested as well, because I think one thing's clear is that how you've all kind of looked at the issue of diversity in newsrooms in different ways and kind of clocked it in, in your work and your projects. Is there anything else you've been working together and sharing ideas with each other on? Peter, do you want to maybe talk about this? Um, yes, uh, I I can speak for mostly myself, but we do collaborate. So the fellowship has various things to offer around uh, seminars and and research, and we do consult each other with that and our work. You know, not strictly related to the fellowship. And I personally reached out to many of the other fellows for help for my research, which is mainly uh, mainly around uh, audience revenues and financing. I think you have to sort of imagine that this is a very strong network of journalism who are, you know, very smart and ambitious people from very diverse backgrounds. And so if you want to look at any one phenomenon globally, like outside of your own context, being here and having this community is is really a great asset because you can just uh, text or call or go on a walk with a person and ask them about what's happening in Nicaragua or Kyrgyzstan or India and it will greatly enhance your understanding or at least it did mine. Thanks, thank you Peter. Malva. I think it's been very helpful as well because all the fellows um, in my case, with the with the handbook that I'm creating, I really need to understand what are the struggles and how do journalists face those challenges as well in different parts of the country with different situations. <clears throat> Pardon. So it's been very helpful because the fellows have shared 
um, contacts from other colleagues that are really struggling with the blackout in, for example, in Kashmir. And um, it's been very, very good because uh, all, the, all the fellows have given me all these contacts and I've had several interviews all over the world and it has increased um, like my awareness on what I really want to do with this manual. So it, it's not only helping uh, my Nicaraguan colleagues, but also um, other journalists all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you again, all of you, for your time and for your energy and for keeping the fellowship going in lockdown, which hasn't been an easy achievement, I know, but we have done it. And thank you also to everyone who's attended the seminars and thank you, and uh, do join in this term. We've been speaking at the seminars about tech platforms, misinformation, business models. This term, we're really focusing on the journalism itself, on storytelling, on narratives, on investigation. We start next week with Hassan Hassan and Kari Shaheen um, talking about New Lines magazine, which is a real new way of reporting on the Middle East. Hassan served as contributing editor at The Atlantic, The Guardian and Foreign Policy, and he's a co-author of ISIS Inside the Army of Terror with Michael Weiss. And Karim Shaheen is a former, is a former editor with and um, former Middle East correspondent for The Guardian um, and a senior editor at New Lines magazine. And it's just going to be a different kind of conversation about reporting on the Middle East. So do please join us for that and for every seminar this term. Thank you all and thank you all again for the to the fellows. See you next week. <laughs>